A truck driver without a license or insurance got into a crash and killed a family of five. Today, a defense team told jurors it wasn't his fault. The person that caused these five tragic deaths is not in this court. Hundreds line up to testify for and against Democrats' most controversial gun bill this year. It might pass the first hurdle, then run into issues. Colorado's largest school district may stop funding a program to support alternative school students as they work toward graduation. And a last ditch effort to save El Chapultepec, a legendary spot for music and culture. This place means so much to the city. That's tonight on Next. The truck crash that killed a family of five on I-25 and brought new scrutiny to the whole trucking industry in our state is now going to trial. Today, that trucker's attorney told jurors that the trucker's brakes did not work, yet he was not responsible. Our Mark Salinger continues his coverage of a split second that changed lives. Sitting inside a Greeley courtroom, Jesus Puebla faces five counts of vehicular homicide. Nearly two years after his truck slammed into a car on I-25 and killed five members of the Godinez and Everts family, today his trial began. This is about the facts and the evidence. We can't have sympathy in this courtroom during the course of this trial. Asking jurors not to sympathize with the personal stories of the five who died, Puebla's attorneys argued the company that owned the truck is truly at fault. So when the prosecution tells you that Mr. Puebla didn't use the brakes, he didn't use the brakes because he didn't have brakes. The truck Puebla was driving was carrying mail for the United States Postal Service. A Colorado State Patrol investigation and the truck driver's own attorneys both conclude the truck did not have working brakes. The brakes did not work at the speed in which Mr. Puebla needed the brakes that day. He had approximately 30% 30, 30 of his braking power. They call it a Frankenstein truck. Lawyers say the company Puebla drove for, Caminantes Trucking, altered the truck, hooking up different brakes that weren't powerful enough to actually stop it. It's an argument prosecutors say is flawed. There was only one person who did not slow down or stop. That man sitting right there. CSP says the truck was going about 70 miles an hour when it crashed into the car that had stopped for traffic. New video shows the scene seconds after the crash. Nobody in the Godinez Everts car survived. Being here, like, I just want to pass out. I want to puke. Um, I can't stop crying. Desiree and Stephen Everts lost their daughter, granddaughter, son-in-law, and in-laws. Today, they sat in the courtroom for the first time, coming face to face with the truck driver, accused of killing their family. He didn't just kill those five people that day. He killed all of our families. We struggle on a daily and. Nothing will ever be the same again. So the interesting thing here is that the defense is not arguing that the truck driver didn't cause the accident. They're just saying he is not the one who should be held accountable for it. They're arguing that the company that owned the truck, that put him in that position, put him in the truck, and he had no chance of stopping that with the brakes not working. Of course, the family who lost five people, Kyle, they say their lives are changed forever. They know that he was the one who didn't break. And this is truly one of those situations that any one of us could be in. Yeah. Because we're all out on the roads, we're all out next to big trucks, and we know that most of those folks are doing things the right way, but one person who's not, disaster. Exactly. Do you want a Frankenstein truck driving behind you? You have no idea if the truck behind you is a Frankenstein truck that doesn't have brakes that are working. This was a truck that was contracted to the United States Postal Service. The Postal Service didn't cancel their contract with Caminantes Trucking, this trucking company, for more than a year after the crash. And, and you've been with us every step of the way through all the changes in the industry and all the scrutiny, and we know that that'll continue. Mark, thank you. Democrats at the state capitol may advance their most controversial gun control bill farther than it got last year, but still not likely to pass. Today, about 600 people signed up to testify for and against a ban on so-called assault weapons. A similar bill died in committee after a marathon hearing just like that last year. This year, it looks like the ban is going to make it out of committee at least. This bill by Denver Democrats Tim Hernandez and Elizabeth Epps defines so-called assault weapons as a 50 caliber rifle or a semi-automatic firearm with a detachable magazine and modification like a pistol grip or muzzle brake. The original version of the bill would ban the manufacture, purchase, sale, or transfer of those weapons, and it would be punishable by enormous fines, up to half a million dollars. There are exceptions to allow members of the military and law enforcement to have those weapons. Supporters of the bill point to Colorado's history of high-profile mass shootings. 
like the shooting at the King Supers in Boulder in 2021. Boulder County commissioners had passed a string of firearms restrictions following that shooting, but they say that they're too hard to enforce at the local level. The Board of Boulder County commissioners passed five local ordinances last year including a prohibition on the sale and purchase of assault weapons, large capacity magazines, and trigger activators. As an elected official, we've done much at the local level, and we recognize that action is still required at the state and federal level. Five Democrats on the committee are co-sponsors, so it's likely this is going to pass out of committee and go to the full House. It gets trickier in the Senate, where Democrats do not have as many votes to spare if some Democrats won't vote for this. And Democratic Governor Jared Polis has been openly skeptical of the idea of state-level gun bans. If this becomes law, the gun rights group Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, which has successfully tangled up Colorado's gun control bills in court in the past, is promising to sue immediately. Let me be clear. If this bill is signed into law before the ink is dried, I will file a lawsuit. I can promise you that. Assault weapons bans passed in other states, like Illinois, have been stalled in federal courts. Supreme Court has declined to take up those cases while they work their way through the appeals process. Colorado's House Republicans are intent on trying to impeach Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold, even though Republicans don't have the votes. And they kind of admitted here on next that impeachment is to help them rally their base for the next election. Today, though, Colorado's chief legal officer weighed in on the whole process. In an advisory opinion, first reported by our partners at Colorado Politics, Democratic Attorney General Phil Weiser said that six statewide officials have ever been impeached in Colorado history. The last was in the 1930s, and not one has ever been removed from office after impeachment. Republicans want Griswold removed because she said that she agreed with the legal effort to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. Griswold was actually sued in that case. She followed the orders of lower courts and the Supreme Court on that issue. Impeachment in our state is for high crimes or misdemeanors or malfeasance in office. The legal definition of malfeasance, according to the attorney general's brief today, quote, requires a wholly wrongful and unlawful act done willfully that involves the violation of a statutory duty or the improper or corrupt exercise of discretionary authority. The AG's legal brief to the House said that impeachment under Colorado law is not designed for purely political reasons. But here's what the lead Republican on the effort told us earlier this month. Uh, this is something that we can say we're doing this, uh, even though it might not be successful in the House. Our constituents can see we, we, we did it, but we can't do anything based on being the super minority. And that can also hopefully help us in the next election cycle. Well, you didn't just say you're impeaching her because it'll help you in the next election cycle. No, I think this will get more people to come to, the, come to vote so that we can get more people voting for what they think is right, knowing that we, they have people standing up in office for them. They need to get more people in office standing up for them. Did you just say the quiet part out loud? What's that? Did you just say the quiet part out loud? The quiet part out loud. We'll move on. The Democrats who control the state house have not yet committed to even bringing the Republicans' impeachment resolution against the secretary up for a vote. Republican Congressman Lauren Boebert is once again taking credit for federal funding for Colorado projects that Boebert actually voted against. Boebert's office sent out a news release bragging about her role in securing funding for projects like highway safety improvements and water reservoir construction in southern Colorado. Boebert requested that funding through the earmark process, which is when members of Congress add local projects to bigger spending bills. In this case, Boebert's earmarks were part of the government spending bill that passed in early March. Boebert is one of 40 Republicans who obtained earmarks and then voted against the bill. She was out calling it, quote, swamp omnibus bill and said that it funded Democratic priorities. In the darkest moments of my life, I came to the village and they really helped me out. A lifeline for Denver Public School students now needs a lifeline of its own as the district cuts funding for a nonprofit serving some of its most needy students. And the music has long since vanished, but Denver's jazz community still fighting to save a legendary club. That's next. Denver Public School says it can do more for Latinos in its community, and now it has a more than 300-page study to back that up. The district shared its La Raza report today. The goal was to highlight the issues that Latino students, parents, and staff face in Denver schools. The report found bullying a lack of tutoring and support, and not enough Latino culture reflected in curriculum. 
So DPS is creating a specific team to work on those issues. This report used data collected from before the time when thousands of migrant students arrived in DPS schools last year. Superintendent Alex Marrero says they are working on a more specific needs assessment for that community. Before we can recalibrate the student, the scholar, the learner, we have to make sure that they're well, right? So that's, uh, that's an immediate next step as well to complement the La Raza findings. This report echoes generations old divides in DPS. Tomorrow marks 55 years since the West High walkout in response to racism in the classroom when students of Mexican descent said they felt unwelcome in DPS. This year, school districts across the country are dealing with the loss of federal COVID relief funding, which is coming to an end. Denver Public Schools is going to lose one program in particular, which helps hundreds of families facing some of the biggest challenges. All that fresh stuff. We are outside the village at CLA right now. I was going to say. <laughs> what is the village? The village is a youth resource center. Amazing to be able to meet the basic needs of students and families of the Central Pathways High Schools. This is the whole village, yeah. Oh, and Kanan. I got you. Kanan is one of our um, longtime participants, has been receiving support from, from us for a couple years now. Kana leads and operates the, the village. Yeah, we can pull for. We provide groceries on a weekly basis. We have a boutique that has clothing, um, hygiene essentials, cleaning supplies. We have mental health supports. We have gang intervention. We have um, workforce readiness. In the darkest moments of my life, I came to the village and they really helped me out. Yeah, I think we need like 10, 10 more bags. Tell me about how you guys are funded. Yeah, uh, the village was initially started with grant funding. When that funding came to an end, we were transitioned to ESSER funding. And ESSER are uh, COVID relief dollars that were distributed to school districts around the country. Unfortunately, those ESSER dollars do run out uh, in the summer of this year. And so as of right now, Just winging it. that would also mean that the village would cease to exist when those funds expire as well. Where do you think you, you would be right now if the village hadn't come into your life? Um, <laughs> probably, I'll probably be incarcerated uh, if I'm being 100% honest. Kids that are, they're lost, you know, and they just need a sense of security and the village provides that. And without that, I don't know what, what would happen, you know? Students like Kanan, um, students like the 500 families that we've supported will be left without a resource that has really proved invaluable to them. Yeah, I think we're good now. Thank you. The village plans to apply for a grant from the nonprofit Caring from Denver Foundation as one last effort to keep providing those resources. Resource provided by Mother Nature was plenty of water to start our year, Chris Bianchi, and we are grateful folks. And we are. Over four inches of rain for us, or I should say precipitation for us, in downtown Denver since the start of the year. That is our wettest start to a calendar year on record for us in downtown Denver. Normally by now, we've seen about an inch and a quarter worth of precipitation. So we have just seen a ton of water. Great news, and we're going to keep it going this upcoming weekend. Until then, though, it's mild and dry with a few mountain snow showers here or there over the next couple of days. Highs today, 60s for us across the eastern plains, a few 70s in a few spots. Very warm, about 5 to 6 degrees above average. And, of course, we're less than three hours away from the official start of spring with the spring equinox. And what exactly does that mean? At 9 or 6 p.m., what happens? Well, the sun's rays will be directly over the equator, which means everyone from the North Pole to the South Pole gets about 12 hours worth of sunlight and it also means, again, the start of spring for us in the northern hemisphere. For our friends in the southern hemisphere, it's the start of fall. For tomorrow, temperatures top out in the mid-60s, low to mid-60s for us, about 5 degrees above our seasonal average. Seven-day forecast, we're in the 60s for the next few days. Then this weekend, things looking interesting with our next storm system taking shape. This is the next thing to watch for. This will be Sunday and into Monday. Area low pressure moves off to the west. It looks too far north for big impacts. This does not look like the big storm we just had a few days ago, but... Could be talking about a few slushy inches of snow for Sunday night and into Monday morning. It's time that we as a city gave a little bit back to this building by honoring its legacy um, and celebrating it. Jazz and Colorado history happened there. Now, an effort to save El Chapultepec. Next. Historic Denver, the preservation group, wants to hold on to a legendary jazz venue in downtown Denver, El Chapultepec. Current owners want to tear it down for new development. It's a common conflict in this city now playing out at a very well-known spot. Here's Angeline McCall. 
A historic landmark at the corner of 20th and Market in downtown Denver has an uncertain future. As one of Denver's most culturally significant music venues, it closed before the pandemic and has been empty ever since. John Deffenbaugh with Historic Denver applied for Al Chapultepec to receive a landmark designation. You know, without existing buildings, we lose layers of our history. With that designation, the current owners would not be able to replace the former jazz venue with an entirely new building shown in this rendering. If this building's not preserved, it will be torn down and will have a hole at the corner of Market Street and 20th, where a new beer patio will be. And we think that's just such a shame. You probably know the people behind the project as the owners of the Colorado Rockies. The Montfort Company also owns Whiskey Row next to El Chapultepec. The company says they wanted to preserve the building when they bought it a couple years ago. It's so frustrating because we look at Whiskey Row, we look at so many other buildings on this block that uh, the Montfort Company have rehabilitated and re-equipped for a future life, and they retain the historic facade. The company says two structural engineers confirmed there were, quote, unpermitted changes that were made by a previous tenant, which raised significant concerns about the building's safety and viability. And you just need to, to look around Lodo to see so many other examples where that same organization has saved existing historic buildings. Without the building, the people who want it preserved say tearing it down will be a loss for the community and the people who have memories from inside. Existing and older buildings are such an important part of our urban fabric. They're a built representation of our city's history. So you know, when we walk past these buildings, we can get a sense of the people who came before us, the activity that took place there. Montfort Company said in a statement that they designed the project over the course of two years and throughout that process learned that it is an impossible feat to try to keep the original building due to its structural integrity. Meanwhile, Historic Denver just started an online petition to sort of quantify the community support to keep it around, and that was just started in the last couple of days. Kyle. And Angelina, it feels like whenever we get to this step in the process, when it spills over into a public filing like this, it started to enter kind of the adversarial period, right? Like if these two groups were likely to work it out on their own, it probably would have happened. And now here we are. Likely, but something that both of them said were th was that they both want to sort of work together. That's something that John mentioned is like, we're willing to work with them and try to preserve this and, you know, sort of create a vision that everyone's happy with. So we'll see how this plays out. All right. Well, a lot of people are watching now because it's in the public arena. Angelina McCall, thank you very much. Back with your feedback next. Appreciate the perspectives of truck drivers in the next audience tonight. Jody Navarrete says, when I worked in road construction, had a CDL. Before you get behind the wheel of any truck, you're required to do a pre-trip inspection, which is where you find out if the truck is safe to operate. More details on that from Joseph Klein, who says he's a retired commercial truck driver, said, the DOT required me to perform a pre-inspection over 100 safety checkpoints. Joseph writes, I am responsible for the safety of my truck. If something's wrong, bad brakes, I would refuse to drive an unsafe vehicle. Joseph says once the driver signs off, the vehicle safety operation is on the driver. If you're not able to be safe, he says, don't drive the truck. Thank you and have a safe day. You want to know how good truck operators operate? They're like that. They wish you a safe day. See you next time.